You may have heard the term ELO thrown about by your favorite esports personalities, but what is ELO? Where does it come from and why should it matter to you? Good morning, everyone. I'm Frosty, the Specialist Q. Today, let's talk about ELO. We're going to be looking at ELO through the perspective of League of Legends and chess. However, these principles are very applicable in any game that utilizes a competitive rank ladder. The ELO rating system comes from an American physicist named Arpad ELO. Arpad was playing in the US Chess Federation upon inception. A few decades later, he developed a relative ranking structure that attempts to numerically define skill disparity between players based on wins, losses, and ties, instead of solely evaluating skill based on tournament performance. As a result, skill evaluation was a bit more fair and accurate. It progressed more frequently and allowed players to better track their progress. Also, you could group players of similar skill levels together to provide a better experience for players at any level. In practice, the difference in the rating between two players could be utilized to predict the outcome of a match. Here's how it worked. If two players were equally skilled, it was expected that each player would score an equal number of wins, losses, and ties. If a player held a rating 100 higher than his opponent, it was expected that he or she would be the victor 64% of the time, and a rating 200 higher meant that a person was expected to win 76% of the time. Because it was expected that the player with the higher rating was better, if a player with a higher rating won, he would gain less rating than if a player with the lower rating won. After all, he was the favorite to win. However, if the player with the lower rating won, the player with the higher rating would expect to lose much more from the loss. In any case, whatever rating that was won by a player, his opponent would lose the same number. This system was so well made that it is still being used in chess today, decades later. And it has also been adapted to fit many sports and online games. But ELO system is not without flaw. An issue with ELO system is that the mathematical calculations don't take into account newcomers to the ladder. If you don't have a starting point, you can't appropriately adjust the rating of either player. This is where things like provisional games and ELO velocity come into play. We'll talk about both of these concepts a little later on. Another issue is that your rating is defined relative to the population. If you have a rating of 1500 this year and you retain the same skill level, your rating may be higher or lower next year based on how good you are compared to the average player at the time. This makes tracking your individual progress a bit more complex. The last thing to mention about ELO's rating system is that ARPAD created a limit to how much a rating could change at the end of a match. It's called the K factor. The maximum change of a lower rated player was 32, and the most a master level player's rating could change was 16. This allowed a little bit more stability for the latter and made upsets a little more tame. All right, let's move on to the game of League of Legends. Before we transition, I need to mention that Riot officially reveals very little about how the rank and matchmaking system functions. This is not an official post by a Riot employee. That being said, this is a reasonable evaluation about how things might work. When you compare and contrast League of Legends to chess, where the ELO system was designed for, we notice some differences that need to be taken into account when implementing this system to evaluate player skill in League of Legends. Firstly, and most noticeably, League is a team game. You have 10 players influencing the outcome of a match with five victors and five losers. Also, you can tie in chess. The same obviously can't be said for League. The game will never end should a Nexus never fall. So how does Riot adapt ELO system to fit League's competitive structure. Let's start with Season 1. The way Riot stated the skill of a player was very similar to how chess organizations do it today, with a number. Your ELO number that was displayed over your rank device was the identifier that declared how good you were, with the top player at the end of NA Season 1 being Voiboy with an ELO of 2550. When you first joined this ladder, there was no way that Riot could know what rating equated to your current skill level. You were assigned a provisional ELO of 1200, which you couldn't see right away. After every game, your new ELO was calculated. Due to the uncertainty of your ELO, you could see large gains and losses in ELO for the first 10 games you played. These were your provisional matches. This was so Riot could start you off with the most appropriate ELO possible. Eventually, after a few games, your rank was displayed on your profile. However, until there was much statistical significance in the amount of games you played, the amount of ELO you could expect to gain or lose stayed quite large until you settled into winning and losing about the same number of games consistently. How confident the ladder is that it has you placed correctly determines how fast you can move on the ladder. But how does Riot know that your rank matches your skill level? Well, going back to our pad system, if you have the same skill level as your opponent, you would expect to win half of your games and lose 
half of your games. This is even more true in League of Legends because you're only one tenth of the players in each game, so the amount you can influence the game is drastically lower than in chess. If you were the common factor in winning several games in a row, it is likely that you were placed in a rank that is lower than appropriate for your skill level so you'll climb faster. You'll continue to climb until you are winning and losing about the same number of matches. The opposite is true if you were the common factor in losing several games in a row. So in League of Legends, if your win percentage in recent games is exactly 50% at any given elo, it is assumed that your rank matches your skill. If Riot believes it has fairly evaluated your skill level, the amount your rank could change after a match becomes less and less the more games you play. When this happens, your elo velocity is quite low because Riot believes you are where you should be. But people can get better or worse over time as they commit meaningful hours to their craft or take long breaks from the game. So, if you're winning several games in a row, it is true that you were the common factor of those games. Not only will your rating increase, but the lateral think it as you placed too low. The amount of change you would expect to see between games would gradually increase as you continue to win because the ladder grows less and less confident it has you placed correctly as you progress on a winning spree. The same is true for a losing spree. This is the concept of ELO velocity. During your provisional games, your ELO velocity is the most volatile. If we move ahead to season three, ELO is rebranded to Matchmaking Rating or MMR and Riot launches the league system. This is what they said about their new system in their announcement video. First, we wanted to move away from having a single ladder containing all ranked players. Moving up one spot when you're 23,000th place doesn't mean much. But moving up a spot when you're ranked third in your Gold Division II league feels great. Second, since the system attempts to put you in leagues with your friends, it makes it easier to develop rivalries with players you care about. Finally, we came up with the idea of the promotion series to let you experience the feeling of being in the finals of a tournament as you advance through the ladder. The new MMR functions the same as ELO did and exists behind the league system. MMR determines what opponents you are matched up against and what teammates you have. Because MMR is independent of rank, this is why you can see yourself matched up against higher or lower ranked players. If you're trying to get promoted to gold, you should expect to play against gold players along the way. This is beneficial because if you continue to win at that MMR, your rank will climb fast. If Riot overestimates your skill and you start to lose, you will still climb until your rank can matches up with your MMR. MMR determines how much LP you gain or lose after a, any given match. If your MMR is too high for your rank, your MMR velocity will be high and you'll gain LP pretty quick. Also, notice that how much your rank changes is 100% dependent on if you win or lose. And things like KDA don't affect how much you climb. How Riot's rank structure stands leading into Season 10. There are some challenges that Riot has to account for when considering matchmaking. The premise is balancing quality games and queue times. The more fair of a game you want, the longer you'll have to wait for it. People won't play if they don't think games are fair, but at the same time, they won't queue up if they have to wait too long to join a match. The first problem is MMR spread. You want games to be fair, so you put players up against each other that appear to have the same skill level. If you had to wait for players that have the exact same MMR, however, queue times would be very long to reflect that. So the wider range of skill you're willing to accept in a game, the shorter your queue time. During times of lower player activity, Riot also has to widen the range of acceptable player skill to keep queue times down. The second challenge that Riot has to overcome is autofill. Due to the complexity of the game, people tend to play the same exact rules consistently. If I'm a talented AD carry and climb into diamond exclusively playing that one role, but then get relegated to playing jungle, my skill levels in AD carry might not translate effectively. My effective skill level that I bring to the table is significantly lower than had I received my main role, and I may be the sole reason we lose the game. The third challenge to discuss is smurfing. This can be bad at lower MMRs because the system believes the smurfing player is at a lower skill level than he actually is. This is combated with MMR velocity to move those players quickly to their actual skill level. Also, this can be healthy for the game to allow players to practice other rules they're less skilled with. Also, realize that if your goal is to climb, rewatch those games and figure out what that smurf player is doing to be effective in your MMR and replicate it to climb or improve. The fourth challenge I'd like to mention is duo queue. You obtain an advantage through personal synergy, communication, tactics, and strategy when you're playing with a person you know and win percentages generally reflect that. In response to this, when you duo queue, you are likely to face up against a team.
team that also has the same number of dual queued players on it, or receive an artificial MMR boost and face more difficult opponents. The raise in MMR may artificially help you climb faster, but I'm not confident this is or isn't the case. There's a couple more things I noticed about League's system. As you go on a winning spree and you continue to look up stats for your teammates, you may notice that you'll likely be paired with other players on winning sprees. When you obtain 100 LP and get put in an advancement or promotion series, you're put on teams that are less likely to win based on your teammates' recent match history, and you really have to prove that you deserve the new rank by carrying your team. It is worth mentioning that every queue you play has a different MMR. This includes normal match queues, an attempt to make matches as fair as possible to the large player bases of each queue. The practical lessons from this information comes down to this. If you want to climb in any ranked game, you have to stop caring about what your rank is as it currently stands. Whatever your rank is right now, that doesn't matter. Do what you can to develop how effective you are in a game. You have to increase how much you can influence the game by improving your personal skill level, then play enough games at your peak performance and you will naturally progress through the ladder. You just have to win more games than you lose and your rank will increase naturally. Recognize that you can't win every game, even if you're the best player in that particular game. You have to learn to mitigate your losses and not become frustrated when they inevitably come. Instead, learn from them as much as you can. Losing is by far the most effective way to learn because it's a lot easier to notice what you're doing wrong. Also, dodging is one of the most important aspects of the game to learn. In the short term when you dodge, you may lose 3 to 10 LP, but you don't lose any MMR. This does multiple things. It technically boosts your MMR compared to your rank, so you may literally receive more LP from wins than had you not dodged games. If you also dodge games that you're confident are losses, your win percentage will be higher, so you'll also climb more quickly. This is even true for promotion games. If you are familiar with a three-time world champion, Faker, and other players from his region, they commonly play with multiple accounts. This lessens the severity of dodging by allowing you to dodge multiple games in a row without increasing the LP and time penalties associated with dodging. If you dodge, you just hop to your second account and rotate as you need to. It also decreases downtime between games after your first dodge. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know by leaving a like. If you learned something new, believe I'm off about anything, or want me to cover something in the future, let me know in the comment section below. As I come to the conclusion of editing this video, my next video idea is mathematically calculating the maximum damage you can do on Vayne, given multiple scenarios, different builds, different opponents, different like circumstances and situations, to mathematically determine what the best build is going into season 10. So if you want to see that, Make sure you subscribe. If you have another idea or want me to do something else in the future, send that in the comment section below. Have a beautiful day. I'm out.